Now we get to put the I in the I in the it's like one reason why I stuck around this course is because of these jokes that I haven't been doing very much. So if you found it funny, right? I have no comment. Okay. All right. So this actually has relatively little to do with eigenvectors. vectors. Oh darn it. Sorry. Oh, I However, it's much bigger than that. Um, I think I'm sharing with you today as applicability far beyond this course. Um, I don't know. You could make an argument that this really should be part of the standard calculus sequence. It's so important. It's so ubiquitous. What I'm showing you today is really, really important, but at the same time, really simple. Um, so I begin with a question, which is, what's the complex vector space? So what is a complex vector space? It, it's Basically, just like a real vector space, what's the big difference? It's an I put under the complex instead of three. <coughs> Say again? Like it's under the complex numbers instead of real numbers? Right, so V is a, I mean, exactly that, a complex vector space. If V has, is a set. Paired with two operations, um, addition, right? That goes from B cross B back to B again, addition, right? And here's the new thing complex, uh, oops, excuse me, scalar multiplication, which is actually a mapping from what? C cross B back into B again. So we can talk about. I mean, this is essentially it, and then, you know, same axioms as before. Um, just replace what? You know, R um, with C for scalars. All right. So there you go. Definition of complex vector space is just a set, which is closed under addition, and multiplication by complex numbers. All right. So <clears throat> what is a complex number? Do you guys know? I mean, we've had some homework and stuff. Just let me just plug it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So definition, complex numbers have the following form. They're, they're A plus uh, A plus BI, such that what? Such that A and B are real numbers, right? Now, um, you know, you can say, well, okay, is, you know, is, is you know, how, how do you, what do you mean I, right? So one answer that was given to this, uh, you know, by Gauss and some others back at the turn of the 19th century, I don't know if I showed this to you guys yet or not, I'll show it to you again if I haven't, or if, I mean, whatever happened, it's going to happen again. So um, if you look at, I mean, complex multiplication doesn't work. So you have, uh, say, C plus IB and A plus BI, how does that, what does that give you? Well, it, it gives you uh, CA um, plus I squared, uh, DB plus I, BA plus I, um, CD. And if you, you know, I squared is equal to minus one, all right? Yeah, because I, you know, you could say I is the square root of minus one. <coughs> so 1776, this, this thing right here. This I is uh, from Euler. In 1777, he invented this notation. Um, CA minus uh, DB plus I uh, times DA. plus CD, right? Now you can say, oh, there's no such thing as a square root minus one. This doesn't make any sense. Arr. I mean, that's a good point you can take. Um, if you meet such people, you can say, well, fine. Just think of it as a formal system. If the square roots of negative numbers are still concerning to you, how about this? Um, if you let R2, which is what? A comma B, such that A and B real numbers. Well, you can, you can define a multiplication on R2 as follows. You can say, well, c times d, c comma d, 
star a comma b, um, you, you can define a multiplication <coughs> as follows. You can say, well, that's just going to be, I'm going to define that to be, you know, ca minus db comma ca plus da. And um, if I do that, you'll see that, that the, for example, the number um, 1, 0, star AB, well, that will give you AB again. All right? On the other hand, if we look at 0, 1, star 0, 1, well, we get 0, what we get, uh, see here we get A is equal to 1, B is equal to 1, a is equal to zero, B is equal to one, and what I'm doing. If you work it out, you'll get minus one comma zero for that, right? So basically what I'm showing you is that one zero behaves like one, whereas zero one behaves like what? I. See, because this times itself gives you back minus the number, which is 1. Well, I said number, but I'm thinking about it as two component vector as a number. <coughs> so if you take R2 and you pair it with this multiplication, this funny star multiplication, this shows you without a doubt that you can construct a formal system which has a multiplication, which is exactly algebraically equivalent to this thing I wrote in green up here where I didn't even address the question of does I exist or not, I just wrote it down and through force of experience you agreed with me. Well, if you doubt the existence, here's a model. If you doubt the existence of the plane, well, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong course. Um, I mean, you can doubt the existence of real numbers if you like. You can have all the doubts you like, I can't stop you. You can doubt your own existence, wouldn't that be profound? <laughs> it's not profound, it's stupid. Sorry. <laughs> Stupid. I, I, I was given the idea that Dr. Professor Pell has never seen the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But the existence of the characters in the matrix is never in question. It's the existence of the world that's in question. Doubting your own existence is stupid. Uh, okay. So I'm saying that. <laughs> Have I seen the matrix? Well, of course, I'm TV. But, um, <laughs> Wait, but no, it's before I was hired, I could watch it. <laughs> uh, it's one of those, like, 90s rated R, which is really, like... I don't know what the rules are. <laughs> <laughs> there was a game, like, teaser that we actually showed a clip from a different class. It was, like, my, my point to you is... My, my point to you is simply this. The complex numbers are something that exists. And you can even construct them from the plane using this funny multiplication. And, and, and so if you if you make this construction, eventually you basically find yourself saying, I'm going to, I, I get tired of writing this, so instead I'm just going to write this as, as a plus IV, right? I'm just going to write it as a plus IV. And when I do that, I'm basically saying that this is equal to one, and this is equal to I, right? And that's an identification which is often made. Now I'm content with the existence of I. But what allows us to um, impose an arbitrary form of multiplication onto R2? Well, you could use a different one if you like, but then that wouldn't be the complex numbers. Well, why are we allowed to do that? Doesn't R2 already have a multiplication? No. No. Oh, would it be? Oh. No, they're, they're actually, so if you take a vector space, and you pair it with a multiplication notion of how to take two vectors and give you back another vector under let's say, quote, unquote, multiplication, your choices are many. There are really many algebras that you can construct a very good vector space. In fact, the problem of classifying how many of those different algebras are non-isomorphic in terms of some sort of algebra isomorphism is an interesting, deep, and not entirely easy question. Um, but anyway, this is the complex. This makes R2 the complex numbers. Which in particular makes it a field because every, you know, you can always, you can, for a non-zero vector, you can find a number, uh, another vector which multiplied by that vector gives you back the number one. Everything has a multiplicative inverse in the complex numbers. So it depends <coughs> what you mean by multiplication. Some people would say it's not really a multiplication unless you have inverses. 
I think those people are silly, but um, they exist. And so if you insist that multiplication it requires the existence of inverses, um, maybe there aren't so many quote unquote multiplications for R2. Um, I could write down, I could write down almost the same thing here, guys. If I change this to a plus, it makes R2 the so-called hyperbolic numbers. If you make this a plus, that essentially looks at something like a plus jb such that j squared is equal to 1. That's not a field. You have products of things which are not zero, which give you back zero. So, yeah. But you can't have multiplication without um, inverse. How do you have multiplication without integers? Um, uh, like but well, in integers don't have inverses. And that's what I'm saying. So how can you not have it? you have multiplication? I'm just saying some people would insist the multiplication for R2 has an inverse for everything. Because R2 isn't like the integers, right? It's complete. Whatever that is. All right, so, so the complex vector. Now, so some examples of complex vector spaces, right? Before I get too distracted with, which should have been a relatively minor point today. Sorry. Um, well, first of all, the complex numbers, right? And basically what I'm showing you Part of the reason for this discussion is I want you to see that you could write it as R direct sum with IR. Right? So any complex number can be written as um, some scalar multiple of 1 and some scalar multiple of I. If you don't like this notation, you could look at this as the span of 1 um, direct sum with the span of I. Now, to be super clear today, I really should say the span over the reals, because we'll be talking about complex spans soon enough. So if I write a sub r on span, that means I'm taking scalars from the reals to form the linear combinations of span. <coughs> That's one example. So this is a complex vector spaces. Uh, another example would be complex n vectors. So what that looks like is z1, z2, da da da, zn, such that what? z sub j is an element of complexes, for j equals to 1 to n, right? Now I would point out to you that for essentially the same reasons we saw earlier in the course, you can still write this as the span over the complexes, right? Of what? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you can write it over the span of the complexes of E1, E2, da da da, En, where these are still the standard, still just a matrix, a, still a vector with just one in the first component and zeros past that, and then two in the second component, and zeros everywhere else, you know, the standard basis, right? They're still in there. But there's another way you could write this, right? You could take each one of these and write it in terms of their real and imaginary parts, right? I could write this as like um, x1 plus i y1, <coughs> x2 plus i y2, xn plus i y n, right? I could take this z and say write that instead. And do you see what, these are real scalars, x1 through xn and y1 through yn. And you see I could pull those out, right? I'd have x1 e1 plus what? y1 times ie1 plus da 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 plus xn en plus iyn oh, plus yn ien. Yes, then? Gosh, don't guess another one. Oh, okay. I will give you a chance to do something here. Um, so my point is, yeah, this is just, you know, so if you, if you group these, you can factor out E1, factor out EN, right? That's what I was claiming up here. You can write any, any complex n vector as a span with complex coefficients of E1 through EN. 
but you see you can also write it as a real span of what? Span over the reals of what? what what's the what basis could I use here at? E1, IE1, right? E2, IE2, EN, IEN. Suggesting to you that there's a kind of stupid way to look at any complex vector space as a real vector space, right? If you think about all these axioms only for complex numbers, if you look at real numbers as being a subset of the complex numbers, well, your favorite axioms of a real vector space are satisfied, right? So it's also a real vector space by default because the reals are a subfield of the complex numbers. So, in some sense, trivially, a complex vector space is automatically a real vector space of double dimension. Yeah. So all you have to do is like, would you have to restrict the basis first to have them kind of be a real vector space, or still like take the complex part of it out? Depends on our starting point. I mean, I don't know. So, how about another example? <clears throat> I think I will answer that question a little later. But <clears throat> Three. Excuse me. Oh, by the way, what else could I bring here? This is, by the way, Rn directs on what? Irn. In fact, I, you know, as a, a little bit of notation, for here, I would have said that the real part of z was equal to x1 <coughs> da, 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 xn. Whereas the imaginary part of Z was equal to Y1, Yn. Um, so in total, we have like Z is equal to the real part of Z plus I times the imaginary part of Z. But you notice, I'm now talking about an N vector. I'm not just talking about a complex number, so maybe this is new. Could you go on with like different ways of writing this, or is that about comfort? It's about comfort? Yeah. How about this? How about n by n matrices? That's where you're coming to that, that one, sorry. Is that your guess? Okay, go. Um, oh, good, good, good. So, of course, here, you could either write this as the span over the complexes of our usual matrix spaces, the unit bases, right, the EIJs, or 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to m, 1 less than or equal to j less than or equal to n. Our usual matrices with 1s in one, one spot and 0 everywhere else, right? 1 in the ij spot, 0 everywhere else. So if you just think about it, if I have a matrix with complex coefficients, I can always just rip it apart into a, 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 a linear combination with complex coefficients of these guys. Or you could do what? You could do the span over the reals, uh, EIJ, comma uh, what? I E I J. That's right. Oh, I is a poor choice of index here, but you guys can deal. Um, and you know, you, you you think it's a danger that you can get confused, but honestly speaking, that's it, it doesn't. Unless you just really really want to try to be confused, it's it's okay. And um. So of course we can also think of this as R M N R M by N direct sum with I R M by N, and you can talk about the real and the imaginary. You can talk about the real and imaginary parts of the matrix just the same. All right. So let me move on. <clears throat> now. 
Now, you, you, you could do more complicated examples, right? You could still look at your linear transformations. Pretty much every example we've done, you can replace the scalars with complex scalars, and you'll have a complex vector space, just as a general rule. But let me stop writing them. And if you really stop and take, take a hard look at all of the theorems we've proved in here, almost without exception, they're true with complex scalars replacing real scalars. If you really look back at all our arguments, all we really needed was the fact that you know reals had that thing that you know a times b is equal to zero means either a is equal to zero or b equals to zero. That that was really the one linchpin to all, all our linear independence arguments. Uh, sometimes we needed to like invert right the existence of inverses. So the, the fact that the real numbers form a field really was most of what we needed. Uh, we haven't really used the order properties of the reals. The fact that you know we've got less than or greater than that much. Anyway, I'm just <coughs> trying to encourage you. Most of the theory we've developed in this course it applies equally well to the complex domain. So the natural question to ask at this point is: Is there any kind of standard way to take a real vector space, right, and change it into a complex vector space? All right. That's what I want to show you now. It's called the complexification. It's called the complexification. We're going to complexify it. That's what I'm complexification. In my uh, in my thesis research, I took uh, we looked at real math. And like I replaced the real numbers with, with what are called, you know, these super numbers. They're they're built from Grassmann generators, right? So some people would call that the grass modification. But anyway. So here's the complexification, yeah. So let let uh let B be a real vector space. Real vector space. <coughs> Then define V sub C, the complexification of V, to be the set, Cartesian product of V with V. So V cross V with addition defined as usual. And multiplication which will be from C cross DC to DC again, defined as follows. So here, here's the interesting part. So I gotta take A plus IB, and I gotta explain how to multiply that on the vector X comma Y. Keep in mind here, X and Y, are elements of an abstract vector space. They're not numbers. I mean, they could be numbers, but they don't have to be. They're vectors, abstract vectors in a vector space B. A plus IB is a complex number. So what's, I need something else in DC, which is a Cartesian product of B and B. What do I put there? Try to make a guess. AX, good start. Ooh, nope. Can't have eyes here. These have, you have to keep it real. I mean, this is this is this is an element of E cross B. So my whatever I write here has to be a real linear combination of real vectors. Minus yep. B Y. Yeah, AX minus ah, B Y. Minus B Y. And then over here. Ay plus bx. Ay plus bx. Yeah. Now is that in v cross b? Well, these are these are real linear combinations of real vectors. So yes, they're again in v because v is a vector space. That's in v because v is a vector space. So it's definitely into the complexification, right? And I think it's pretty clear from the formula that it's single value, right? If you can write a formula for something. And there's no kind of equivalence classes in single value. Um,
then I guess the question is, does it deserve to be called the complexification, yes or no? <coughs> well, let's look at some, let's make some observations here. Let's make some observations here about this so-called complexification gate. First of all, you'll notice that one times x, y is equal to what? Well, let me just make a generic comment before I even do that. What's a, just the real number a times x, y? Ax, y, I mean ax, 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 So it reduces to just real scalar <coughs> multiplication in the case that the complex scalar happens to be a real scalar. That's a good sign. So in particular, one interesting aspect of that is 1 times the vector it gives you back the vector again. That's one of the things you need for it to be a scalar multiplication. That's one of the axioms which we needed for our scalar multiplication. True for complex vector spaces, just like for reals. The other thing is 0 times the vector should be 0, 0, right? Which is, by the way, the 0 in B cross B, right? B, C. And then, of course, minus 1 also works as it ought to, right? Minus 1 times x, y is equal to minus x minus y, which is minus x comma y. I mean, so multiplication by minus 1 gives me the additive inverse, good. Okay, so these go to argue, I'm not going to give you a complete proof, but these, these go to show you that in fact that this really does make the complexification an honest to goodness complex vector space. I haven't given you the complete proof, but there's the start of it, right? Now, what's the interesting part though? <clears throat> So I, I said, interesting part here. Blue marker. I got a blue marker. What? It's funny. So, what happens with i times x y? What, what's that do for us? So that would be a equals to 0, b equals to 1. So we get what we get? Minus y, x. That doesn't, I mean, so OK, great. I mean, it, it's going to satisfy the axioms of complex vector space, but you know, if I always had to use this d cross b notation, I probably wouldn't even bother with with this, uh, you know, I think the beautiful thing here is there's a better notation for this, right? In the same way that, in the ordinary case, I stop writing a comma b at some point and I just start writing a plus i b, right? Because it's just it's just better. For the same reason, you can identify. We identify, right? We can trade our a x minus b y. Well, let me be more to the point here. So. So an identification, guys, when people start talking about identifying things, what they're really saying is that they're going to hide an isomorphism. There's an isomorphism psi, all right? And the psi isomorphism I'm thinking of is, say, v um, going to what? v cross the zero vector space. It's not hard to see that the isomorphism would be defined by what? Psi of x is equal to x comma zero. That, that is definitely objective, and it's definitely surjective onto the space I claim it is. It's not hard to see that that is in fact an isomorphism. So, you know, you can start writing psi of x everywhere, right? But what people do in practice is they don't write that. They say something like this. They say, we're going to identify x comma y with x plus i y. Now, are those things equal? Uh, not really. So if you say they're equal, basically you're hiding the isomorphism. Because what I should really write, of course, is what? Oh, I don't know if I should hide. I'll say this green 
numbers, right, and replace your vectors with complex linear combinations of those vectors, and then just proceed as if everything works the same, just remember i squared is minus 1. Now, I've given you a more careful version of that over here, right, but in practice, we like to use this notation just to be less obtuse. Yeah? Why would you want to? Ah, yes, that is the question. Why indeed? In order to understand that, we need two theorems. First of all, <coughs> theorem. If beta is a real basis for V, then beta is a complex basis for the complexification. I mean, if you really go back to my examples, it's not hard to convince yourself that the complexification of the reals is the complexes. The complexifications of Rn, complexification of Rn is Cm. The complexification of Rn by n is Cm by n. In each one of those cases, I showed you that the basis, the standard basis for Rn, is also the standard basis for Cn, provided we replace the coefficients with complex coefficients as opposed to real coefficients. I'm just saying that's true in general, for the classification at least. How do you prove this? So, linear independence, right? So let's suppose beta is linear independent um, over the reals, right? Consider, let's say, C1, um, C1, B1, plus da, 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 plus Cn, Dn equals to zero for C1, C, C1 through Cn elements of the complex numbers, all right? In other words, consider a complex linear combination equal to zero. That's what I have to face in order to show that beta is linearly independent over the complex vector space, right? What does it mean 
to say that a complex linear combination. Now, you notice that notice that um, v1, uh, the, the you know the real part of v1 is equal to well vj is equal to vj, right? And um, ah, sorry, I guess I really should have stupid. There's two obvious definitions I really should make back here. What's the real part of x comma y? <coughs> Real part of x, y, x. Imaginary part of x comma y, y. Okay. So the real part of the vj is just vj because, um, I, you know, so this, to be to be a bit of two for just a second here, guys, <clears throat> if I'm going back to the careful notation, I shouldn't really say beta, right? There I'm making the identification when I say that. If I don't make the identification, what I would say is this. V j comma zero parentheses such that V j is an element of beta. That's the basis for the complex complexification, right? If you insist on looking at them in pairs. If you're comfortable with the idea that I can just trade the pair V j comma zero for just V j, there you go, and that's in the set. That is in the that is the sense in which I say the beta is also a complex basis for VC. So you notice that the the real part of VJ is just well, I say real part of VJ is VJ, but what I really should say is what. To be more careful, what should I replace this with? VJ zero. Yeah. I should say the real part of VJ comma zero is VJ. Fine. All right. So <clears throat> if you look at this equation. At star, right? And you say, well, the real part of star <coughs> equals to zero. And you also have that the imaginary part of that equation star is equal to zero. Those give us two separate real equations. The real part gives me, let's say, um, a1, um, b1, plus da 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 plus an, bn equals to zero. And and then I also have that v1, v1 plus da 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 plus bn, bn equals to zero, where I denoted c sub j as being a sub j plus i v sub j, or a sub j comma v sub j in the reals. So if we have this complex linear combination is equal to zero, that means I have separately the real part of that complex combination zero and the imaginary part of the complex combination zero. But it's particularly easy to analyze because I'm taking real vectors with complex coefficients, right? So the real imaginary part really are just, they just kind of decouple like this. And then what, what, what does each one of those equations tell me? Since I know it's linear independent over R, right? So I'm assuming that beta is linear independent over R. So that tells me that A1, A2 equals to, uh, equals to AN equals to zero. And this one tells me that B1 through BN is equal to zero. This is by the real linear independence of beta. But what does that say? Yeah, it says cj is equal to zero for all j. Therefore, beta is linearly independent over c. <clears throat> There's actually a lot in this proof that is typical of how we do calculations. Um, and part of, well, the answer to Jillian's question is hardly, so I don't know if I'm going to get to it today. I'm going to try. Then what's the other thing? Span. How do we prove span? So, is is, is beta a spanning set? Let's so let's let uh, you know, x plus i value <coughs> element of v c. Or if that's you know you guys are not comfortable with this yet, are you? You'd rather have to use the pairs, wouldn't you? That's fine. This is fine. That's fine. Yeah, do that. All right. That was the biggest. But anyway, so 
here, x is equal to a sum, um, x sub j, v sub j, right? J equals one n. And y is equal to a sum over j, y sub j, v sub j, j equals one n. You know, if I'm saying beta is v1 through vn, I mean, I mean, I said that before, I'm saying vn. <laughs> I guess I never said that at the start, but I'm just assuming it. <laughs> Sorry. I really should have told you at the start of all this. <coughs> beta is V1 through Vn. I sometimes think you're clairvoyant. That may or may not be true. Um, so, check it out. X plus Iy. So I have this and I have that from the fact that beta is a basis over the reals, right? So just put both of those in there, factor out the sum, and you see what you have. So I've got x, uh, well I'll write a step, xj, vj plus i, yj, vj. So let's see here, I can factor out the vj, j equals one n, x sub j plus i times y sub j times v sub j. But that is a complex linear combination of the basis beta. That is something that's in the span of beta over the complexes. This is an element of span c beta. So I took an arbitrary point in the complexification. I just showed this in here. So therefore, the complexification is a subset of the span over the complexes of beta versus beta. And the converse direction is almost immediate. Conversely, it's clear that the span over the complexes of beta is a subset of BC. Because, well, I mean, that's not that hard to see. The span of the complexes of the beta is complex linear combinations of the, the, the vectors in B, but that's of course, again, in, in the complexification because B is a vector space. So, therefore, the span over the complexes of beta is equal to So this is a very, very nice theorem. It says that if you have a basis for your vector space, you automatically have a basis for your complexification. But it, there's more than this. There's more than this. So <clears throat> given a linear transformation, which is really what we're after, given a linear transformation on the real vector space, a real linear transformation, right? If I have t, that goes from B to B, B a real vector space, and we can define the complexification of B. We go from the complexification of B to the complexification of B by simply the following. Um, if beta is basis for B, let um, T sub C restricted to beta equal to T restricted to beta can extend linearly. Equivalently means so that's one way you could define it. <clears throat> Just define the values for the complexified linear operator um, by the values on the basis for the real vector space, which you know are forming a basis for the complex vector space. And by our linear extension theorem, there's a unique linear transformation which is built from extending off that basis that still holds in the complex domain, that theorem, that linear extension theorem. Equivalently, you could just define the complexified T acting on X plus I, Y by the following formula. What would you do? I'll start you out. E of X. Plus I, T, Yes. 
See, Chris is more complex than we realize. <laughs> I'll take that as an insult. Mm -hmm. what? Take that as an insult. Yeah, that was kind of complex. Cool. Right. <laughs> um, well, that's not a theorem, right? This is a definition. Here's the theorem that's awesome. Theorem. The matrix of T complexify T with respect to the beta basis is equal to the matrix of T with respect to the basis beta. Over here, we're talking about calculation in the complexification. Over here, I'm talking about calculation in the real vector space. This is a bridge between worlds. It's wonderful. And this is really the reason we look at the complexification, OK? Let me show you. So after the dust settles here, the moral of the story is this. We can take a given real problem, right? and we can complexify it. What that allows us to do is to replace our real vector arguments with complex vector arguments, right? And many times we can solve a problem that we couldn't have otherwise solved. Yeah? So basically any linear transformation we've done before, we could make it complexify, and then you'll get a, um, also like the, um, uh, the, the matrix. I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to give an example from, um, no, well, yeah, differential equations, y prime prime equals to zero, right? So if you look at d squared plus one, but I think the answer to your question was yes, um, if you look at d squared plus one and y equal to zero, you know, I could say my transformation t is d squared plus one, right? It turns out that that's defined in a finite dimensional vector space because of the solution set theory of differential equations. Stuff we don't know. But, you know, if I could factor this, right? If I could factor this, then it would be ever so much nicer. But technically speaking, I really shouldn't do that here. This is a real, this is a real linear transformation. That really shouldn't be allowed. You know? Because this takes me into a complex domain. However, if I look at the complexification of T, which nobody writes, then it makes perfectly good sense to say um, the same formula holds because, well, and so there I could do this, you know? And it's easy to see that um, D plus I um, times E to the minus i theta is equal to zero, and, and d minus i times e to the i theta is equal to zero, because the derivative with respect to theta of e to the plus or minus i theta is just equal to plus or minus i e to the i theta plus or minus i theta. So e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta, these are in the kernel of these operators. And so, it's not at all difficult to see that um, then t sub c times e to the i theta, well, plus or minus that really, is equal to zero. So who cares? Well, the thing about that, though, is that that is what? That's actually t sub c cosine theta plus or minus i sine theta equal to zero. But what was our definition of complexification? This is t cosine theta plus or minus i t of sine theta is equal to zero. What's that actually tell me? The real part and the imaginary part separately tell me that t of cosine theta <coughs> is equal to zero and t of sine theta is equal to zero. In other words, the real and imaginary parts of my complexified solution 
are separately and independently solutions to the real problem, which we began with. And this is a generic pattern that we see across all applications of this idea. You take a real problem, okay, you complexify it. You solve the complexified problem, it gives you a complex solution. If it's a linear problem, the real and imaginary parts of the complex solution will separately and independently solve your original real problem. That is why we care about this. That's why it's worthwhile. Yes? So, because I'm studying differential equations right now, yeah. and the piece, D operator, whatever, that's what it's doing as a linear transformation. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, any, any homogeneous differential equation we could rewrite as simply a, a linear transformation acting on something equal to zero, you're finding the kernel of that linear transformation. Now, I'm going to apply this idea next class to the problem of complex eigenvectors. You see what we have is we calculated the determinant of a minus lambda i, right, equal to zero. And sometimes it gave us something like alpha plus or minus i beta. And in order to understand that, I have to solve a minus alpha plus i beta times the identity matrix times a vector equals to zero. What right do I have to do this? The reason I can do this is I'm looking at the complexification of the linear operator. And so for the complexification of the linear operator, I can look for complex solutions. And once I find those complex solutions, I understand systematically how they tell me about the real solutions to the corresponding real problem. That's what I will show you in detail next time. That will help solve like 145 or 143. Sorry, I didn't talk faster today. Yeah. So basically, complexification gives us the right to do that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Complexification justifies any time in any other class. And like, let's just consider complex solutions. No, like that. Okay. That's the complexification. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>